Section 18 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Veronica Cerny. The Good Woman by Mademoiselle de la Force. Translated by James Planchet. There was once upon a time a good woman who was kind, candid, and courageous. She had experienced all the vicissitudes which can agitate human existence. She had resided at court and had endured all the storms to which it is so subject treasons, perfidies, infidelities, loss of wealth, loss of friends so that, disgusted with dwelling in a place in which dissimulation and hypocrisy have established their empire, and weary of an intercourse wherein hearts never appear as they really are, she resolved to quit her own country and go to a distance where she could forget the world and where the world would hear no more of her. When she believed herself far enough off, she built a small house in an extremely agreeable situation. All she could then do was to buy a little flock of sheep, which furnished her with food and clothing. She had hardly made trial of this mode of life before she found herself perfectly happy. There is, then, some state of existence in which one may enjoy content, said she, and the choice I have made leaves me nothing to desire. She passed each day in plying her distaff and tending her flock. She would sometimes have liked a little society, but she feared the danger of it. She was insensibly becoming accustomed to the life she led when one day, as she was endeavouring to collect her little flock, it began to scatter itself over the country and fly from her. In fact, it fled so fast that in a very short time she could scarcely see one of her sheep. "'Am I a devouring wolf?' cried she. "'What means this wonder?' She called to a favourite ewe, but it appeared not to know her voice. She ran after it, exclaiming, I will not care for losing all the rest of the flock if thou dost but remain to me. But the ungrateful creature continued its flight and disappeared with the rest. The good woman was deeply distressed at the loss she had sustained. I have now nothing left, cried she. Maybe I shall not find even my garden, or my little cottage will no longer be in its place. She returned slowly, for she was very tired with the race she had had. She lived upon fruit and vegetables for some time, after exhausting a small stock of cheese. She began to see the end of all this. "'Fortune,' said she, "'thou hast in vain sought to persecute me even in this remote spot. Thou canst not prevent me from being ready to behold the gates of death without alarm, and after so much trouble I shall descend with tranquillity into those peaceful shades.' She had nothing more to spin, she had nothing more to eat. Leaning on her distaff, she bent her steps towards a little wood, and looking round for a place to rest in, she was astonished at seeing run towards her three little children, more beautiful than the fairest day. She was delighted to see such charming company. They loaded her with a hundred caresses, and as she seated herself on the ground, in order to receive them more conveniently, one threw its little arms round her neck, the other encircled her waist from behind, and the third called her mother. She waited a long time to see if someone would not come to fetch them, believing that those who had led them thither would not fail to return for them. All the day passed without her seeing any one. She resolved to take them to her own home, and thought heaven had sent her this little flock instead of the one she had lost. It was composed of two girls, who were only two or three years old, and a little boy of five. Each had a little ribbon round its neck, to which was attached a small jewel. One was a golden cherry enameled with crimson, and engraved with the name of Lirette. She thought that this must be the name of the little girl who wore it, and she resolved to call her by it. The other was a medlar, on which was written Myrtis, and the little boy had an almond of green enamel, around which was written Finfin. The good woman felt perfectly satisfied that these were their names. The little girls had some jewels in their head-dresses, and more than enough to put the good woman in easy circumstances. She had very soon bought another flock, and surrounded herself with everything necessary for the maintenance of her interesting family. She made their winter clothing of the bark of trees, and in the summer they had white cotton dresses of the finest bleaching. Young as they were, they tended their flock, and this time the flock was faithful, 
and was more docile and obedient to them than towards the large dogs which guarded them and these dogs were also gentle and attached to the children they grew visibly and passed their days most innocently they loved the good woman and were all three excessively fond of each other they occupied themselves in tending their sheep fishing with a line spreading nets to catch birds working in a little garden of their own and employed their delicate hands in cultivating flowers there was one rose tree which the young lirette was especially fond of she watered it often and took the greatest care of it she thought nothing so beautiful as a rose and loved it above all other flowers she had a fancy one day to open a bud and try to find its heart when in doing so she pricked her finger with a thorn the pain was sharp and she began to cry the beautiful finfin who very seldom left her approached and began to cry too at seeing her suffer he took her little finger pressed it and squeezed the blood gently from it the good woman who saw their alarm at this accident approached and learning the cause of it why so inquisitive said she why destroy the flower you love so much i wanted its heart replied lirette such desires are always fatal replied the good woman but mother pursued lirette why has this flower which is so beautiful and which pleases me so much thorns to show you said the good woman that we must distrust the greatest part of those things which please our eyes and that the most agreeable objects hide snares which may be to us most deadly how replied lirette must one not then love everything which is pleasant no certainly said the good woman and you must take good care not to do so but i love my brother with all my heart replied she he is so handsome and so charming you may love your brother replied her mother but if he were not your brother you ought not to love him lirette shook her head and thought this rule very hard finfin meanwhile was still occupied with her finger he squeezed on the wound the juice of the rose leaves and wrapped it in them the good woman asked him why he did that because i think said he that the remedy may be found in the same thing which has caused the evil the good woman smiled at this reason my dear t child replied she not in this case i thought it was in all cases said he for sometimes when lirette looks at me she troubles me greatly i feel quite agitated and the moment after those same looks cause me a pleasure which i cannot express to you when she scolds me sometimes i am very wretched but let her speak at length one gentle word to me i am all joy again the good woman wondered what these children would think of next she did not know their relations to each other and she dreaded their loving each other too much she would have given anything to learn if they were brother and sister her ignorance on this point caused her great anxiety but their extreme youth reassured her finfin was already full of attention to the little lirette he loved her much better than Mirtis. he had at one time given her some young partridges the prettiest in the world which he had caught she reared one which became a fine bird with very beautiful plumage lirette loved it excessively and gave it to finfin it followed him everywhere and he taught it a thousand diverting tricks he had one day taken it with him when going to tend his flock on returning home he could not find his partridge he sought for it everywhere and distressed himself greatly at its loss Murtis tried to console him but without success sister he replied i am in despair lirette will be angry all you say to me does not diminish my grief well brother said she we will get up very early to-morrow and go in search of another i cannot bear to see you so miserable lirette arrived as she said this and having learnt the cause of finfin's sorrow she began to smile my dear brother said she to him we will find another partridge it is nothing but the state in which i see you that gives me pain these words suffice to restore serenity and calm to the heart and countenance of Finfin. Why, said he to himself, could Murtis not restore my spirits with all her kindness, while Lirette has done it with a single little word? Two is one too many. Lirette is enough for me. On the other hand, Murtis saw plainly that her brother made a difference between her and Lirette. Oh, we are not enough here being three, said she. I ought to have another brother who would love me as much as Finfin does my sister. Lirette was now twelve years old. 
Murtis, thirteen, and Finfin, fifteen. When one evening after supper they were all seated in front of the cottage with the good woman who instructed them in a hundred agreeable things. The youthful Finfin, seeing Lirette playing with a jewel on her neck, asked his dear mamma what it was for. She replied that she had found one on each of them when they fell into her hands. Lirette then said, "'If mine would but do as I tell it, I should be glad.' "'And what would you have it do?' asked Finfin. "'You shall see,' said she, and then taking the end of the ribbon. "'Little Cherry,' she continued, "'I should like to have a beautiful house of roses.' At the same moment they heard a slight noise behind them. Murdis turned round first, and uttered a loud cry. She had cause, for instead of the cottage of the good woman, there appeared one of the most charming that could possibly be seen. It was not lofty, but the roof was formed of roses that would bloom in winter as well as in summer. They entered it and found the most agreeable apartments furnished magnificently. In the midst of each room was a rose-tree in full flower, in a precious vase, and in the first which they entered they found the partridge Finfin had lost, which flew on to his shoulder and gave him a hundred caresses. "'Is it only to wish?' said Murtis, and taking the ribbon of her jewel in her hand. "'Little Medlar,' she continued, "'give us a garden more beautiful than our own.' Hardly had she finished speaking when a garden was presented to their view of extraordinary beauty— and in which everything that could be imagined to delight the senses appeared in the highest perfection. The young folks began immediately to run through the beautiful alleys, amongst the flower-beds, and round about the fountains. "'Do you wish something, brother?' said Lirette. "'But I have nothing to wish for,' said he, "'except to be loved by you as much as you are loved by me.' "'Oh!' replied she, "'my heart can satisfy you on that point. That does not depend on your almond.' "'Well, then,' said Finfin, "'almond, little almond, I wish that a great forest should rise near by, in which the king's sh son shall come to hunt, and that he shall fall in love with Murtis. "'What have I done to you?' replied the beautiful girl. "'I do not wish to leave the innocent life which we lead.' "'You are right, my child,' said the good woman, "'and I admire the wisdom of your sentiments.' besides which they say that this king is a cruel usurper who has put to death the rightful sovereign and all his family. Perhaps the son may be no better than his father. The good woman, however, was quite astonished at the strange wishes of these wonderful children, and knew not what to think of them. When night was come she retired into the house of roses, and in the morning she found that there was a large forest close to the house. It formed a fine hunting-ground for our young shepherds. Finfin often hunted down it, deer, hearts, and roebucks. He gave a fawn whiter than snow to the lovely Lirette. It followed her as a partridge followed Finfin, and when they were separated for a short period they wrote to each other and sent their notes by these messengers. It was the prettiest thing in the world. The little family lived thus tranquilly, occupied with different employments according to the seasons. They always attended to their flocks, but in the summer their occupations were most pleasant. They hunted much in the winter. They had bows and arrows, and sometimes went such long distances that they returned, with slow steps and almost frozen, to the house of roses. The good woman would receive them by a large fire. She did not know which to begin to warm first. Lirette, my daughter Lirette, she would say, place your little feet here. And taking Murtis in her arms, Murtis, my child, continued she, Give me your beautiful hands to warm, and you, my son, Finfin, come nearer. Then, placing them all three on a sofa, she would pay them every attention in the most charming and gentle manner. Thus they passed their days in peace and happiness. The good woman wondered at the sympathy between Finfin and Lirette, for Murtis was as beautiful and had no less amiable qualities. But certainly Finfin did not love her as fervently as the other. "'If they are brother and sister, as I believe,' said the good woman, "'by their matchless beauty, what shall I do? "'They are so similar in everything that they must assuredly be of the same blood. "'If it be so, this affection is very dangerous. "'If not, I might render it legitimate by letting them marry, "'and they both love me so much that their union would ensure joy and peace to my declining days.' In her uncertainty she had forbidden Lirette, 
who was fast advancing to womanhood to be ever alone with finfin and for better security she had ordered Mirtis to be always with them lirette obeyed her with perfect submission and Mirtis did also as she had commanded her the good woman had heard speak of a clever fairy and resolved to go in search of her and endeavour to enlighten herself respecting the fate of these children one day when lirette was slightly indisposed and Mirtis and finfin were out hunting the good woman thought it a convenient opportunity to go in search of madame tutu for such was the name of the fairy she left lirette therefore at the house of roses but she had not got far on her way before she met lirette's fawn which was going towards the forest and at the same time she saw finfin's partridge coming from it they joined each other close to her it was not without astonishment that she saw round the neck of each a little ribbon with a paper attached she called the partridge which flew to her and taking the paper from it she read these lines to lirette dear bird repair absent from her sight i languish all my love to her declare secret joy and silent anguish much too cold her heart i fear such a passion e'er to know were i to her but half as dear no greater bliss i'd crave below <gasps> what words cried the good woman what phrases simple friendship does not express itself with so much warmth then stopping the fawn which came to lick her hand she unfastened the paper from its neck opened it and found in it these words the sun is setting you are absent yet although you left me by its earliest light return dear finfin surely you forget without you day to me is endless night just as they did when i was in the world continued the good woman who could have taught lirette so much in this desert what can i do to cut betimes the root of so pernicious an evil eh madam where what are you so anxious about said the partridge let them alone those who conduct them know better than you the good woman remained speechless she knew well that the partridge spoke by means of supernatural art the note fell from her hands in her fright the fawn and the partridge picked them up the one ran and the other flew and the partridge called so often tutu that the good woman thought it must be that powerful fairy who had caused it to speak she recovered herself a little after this reflection but not feeling equal to the journey she had undertaken she retraced her steps to the house of roses meanwhile finfin and Mirtis had hunted the livelong day and being tired they had placed their game on the ground and sat down to rest under a tree where they fell asleep the king's son also hunted that day in the forest he missed his suite and came to the place where our young shepherd and shepherdess were reposing he contemplated them for some time with wonder finfin had made a pillow of his game bag and the head of Mirtis reclined on the breast of finfin the prince thought Mirtis so beautiful that he precipitately dismounted from his horse to examine her features with more attention he judged by their scripts and the simplicity of their apparel that they were only some shepherd's children he sighed from grief having already sighed from love and this love even was followed in an instant by jealousy the position in which he found these young people made him believe that such familiarity could only result from the affection which united them in this uneasy state of mind not being able to tolerate their prolonged repose he touched the handsome finfin with his spear he started up and seeing a man before him he passed his hand over the face of Mirtis and awoke her calling her sister a name which dissipated in a moment the alarm of the young prince Mirtis rose up quite astonished she had never seen any one but finfin the young prince was the same age as herself he was superbly attired and had a face full of charming expression he began saying many sweet things to her she listened to him with a pleasure which she had never before experienced and she responded to them in a simple manner full of grace finfin saw that it was getting late and the fawn having arrived with, with lorette's letter he told his sister it was time to go home come brother said she to the young prince giving her her hand come with us into the house of roses for as she believed finfin to be her brother she thought that every one who was handsome like him must be her brother also the young prince did not require much pressing to follow her finfin threw on the back of his fawn the game he had shot and the handsome prince carried the bow and the game-bag of Mirtis. in this order they arrived at the house of roses 
Lirette came out to meet them. She gave the prince a smiling reception and turned towards Myrtis. "'I am delighted,' said she, "'that you have had such good sport.' They went all together to seek the good woman, to whom the prince made known his high birth. She paid due attention to so illustrious a guest, and gave him a handsome apartment. He remained two or three days with her, and this was long enough to complete his conquest by Myrtis, according to Finfin's request to his little almond. Meanwhile, the suite of the prince had been much surprised at his absence. They had found his horse, and they believed that some frightful accident had befallen him. They sought him everywhere, and the wicked king, who was his father, was in a great fury at their not being able to find him. The queen his mother, who was very amiable, and the sister of the king whom her husband had cruelly murdered, was in an inconceivable state of grief at the loss of her son. In her extreme distress she sent secretly in search of Madame Tutu, who was an old friend of hers, but whom she had not seen for some time, because the king hated her and had done her much injury with the person she dearly loved. Madame Tutu arrived, without being perceived, in the cabinet of the queen. After they had embraced each other affectionately, for there is not much difference between a queen and a fairy, they having almost equal power, the fairy Tutu told her that she would very soon see her son. She begged her not to make herself uneasy, and not to be at all distressed at anything that might happen, that either she was very much deceived, or she could promise her a delight which was quite unexpected by her, and that she would be one day the happiest of creatures. The king's people made so many inquiries for the prince, and sought him with so much care, that at length they found him at the House of Roses. They led him back to the king, who scolded him brutally, as though he were not the most beautiful youth in the world. He remained very sad at the court of his father, and thinking of his beautiful Murdis. At length his grief was so visible on his countenance that he was obliged to take his mother into his confidence, who consoled him extremely. "'If you will mount your beautiful palfrey,' said he, "'and come to the House of Roses, you will be charmed with what you will see.' The queen consented willingly and took her son with her, who was enchanted at seeing his dear mistress again. The queen was astonished at the great beauty of Myrtis, and also at that of Lirette and Finfin. She embraced them with as much tenderness as if they had been her own children, and conceived an immense friendship from that moment for the good woman. She admired the house, the garden, and all the curiosities she saw there. When she returned, the king desired her to give an account of her journey. She did so naturally, and he took a great fancy to go also and see the wonders which she had described. His son asked permission to accompany him. He consented with a sullen air, for he never did anything with a good grace. As soon as he saw the House of Roses he coveted it, he paid not the least attention to the charming inhabitants of this beautiful place, and by way of commencing to take possession of their property, he said that he would sleep there that evening. The good woman was very much vexed at such a resolution. She heard an uproar and saw a disorder in her household which frightened her. "'What has become,' cried she, "'of the happy tranquillity which I once enjoyed here? The least breath of fortune destroys all the calm of life.' She gave the king an excellent bed, and withdrew into a corner of the dwelling with her little family. The wicked king went to bed, but found it impossible to go to sleep, and opening his eyes he saw at the foot of his couch a little old woman, who was not half a yard high and about as broad. She had great spectacles which covered all her face, and she made frightful grimaces at him. The base are generally cowards. He was in a terrible fr fright, and felt at the same time a thousand points of needles pricking him all over. In this tormenting state of body and mind he was kept awake the entire night, and made a great noise about it. The king stormed and swore in language which was not at all consistent with his dignity. "'Sleep, sleep, sire!' said the partridge, or let us sleep. If the condition of royalty is so full of anxiety, I prefer being a partridge to being a king. The king was more than ever alarmed at these words. He commanded them to seize the partridge, which roosted in a porcelain vase, but she flew away at this order, beating his face with her wings. He still saw the same vision, and felt the same prickings. He was dreadfully frightened, 
and his anger became more furious. "'Ah!' said he, "'it is a spell of this sorceress, whom they call the good woman. I will rid myself of her and all her race by putting them to death.' He got up, not being able to rest in bed, and as soon as day broke he commanded his guards to seize all the innocent little family and fling them into dungeons. He had them dragged before him that he might witness their despair. Those charming faces bedewed with tears touched him not. On the contrary, he felt a malignant joy at the sight. His son, whose tender heart was rent by so sad a spectacle, could not turn his eyes upon Murtis without an agony which nothing could exceed. A true lover on such occasions suffers more than the person beloved. They seized these poor innocents, and were leading them away when the young Finfin, who had no arms with which to oppose these barbarians, took the ribbon on a sudden from his neck. "'Little Almond,' cried he, "'I wish that we were out of the power of the king. "'And with his great enemies, my dear Cherry,' continued Lirette, "'and that we might take away with us the handsome prince, my medlar,' added Murtis. They had hardly uttered these words when they found themselves with the prince— the partridge, and the fawn, all together in a car, which, rising with them in the air, they soon lost sight of the king and the house of roses. Murtis had no sooner expressed her wish than she repented of it. She knew well that she had inconsiderately allowed herself to be carried away by an impulse of which she was not the mistress. Therefore, during all the journey, she kept her eyes cast down, and felt much abashed. The good woman gave her a severe glance. "'My daughter,' said she. You have not done well to separate the prince from his father. However unjust he may be, he ought not to leave him. Ah, oh, madam, replied the prince, do not complain that I have the happiness of following you. I respect the king my father, but I should have left him a hundred times had it not been for the virtue, the kindness, and tenderness of the queen my mother, which have always detained me. As he finished these words, they found themselves in front of a beautiful palace, where they alighted and were received by Madame Tutu. She was the most lovely person in the world, young, lively, and gay. She paid them a hundred compliments, and confessed to them that it was she who had given them all the pleasures which they had enjoyed in their lives, and had also bestowed on them the cherry, the almond, and the medlar, the virtues of which were at an end, as they had now arrived in her dominions. Then, addressing the prince in private, she told him that she had heard speak a thousand times of the annoyance he had met with from his father, but, in order that he could not attribute to her any evil that might hereafter befall the king, she frankly admitted she had played him some tricks, but that was the full extent of her vengeance. After that, she assured them that they would all be very happy with her, that they should have flocks to keep, crooks, bows, arrows, and fishing rods, in order that they might amuse themselves in a hundred different ways. She gave them shepherds' dresses of the most elegant description, including the prince with the others, their names and devices being on their crooks. And that very evening the young prince exchanged crooks with the charming Murtis. The next day Madame Tutu led them to the most delightful promenade in the world, and showed them the best pasturage for their sheep, and a fine country for the chase. "'You can go,' said she, "'on this side, as far as that beautiful river, but never to the opposite shore. "'And you may hunt in this wood, but beware,' said she, "'of passing a great oak which is in the midst of the forest. "'It is very remarkable, for it has roots and trunk of iron. "'If you go beyond it, misfortunes may happen to you, from which I cannot protect you. And "'Besides that, I should not perhaps be in a position to assist you promptly, "'for a fairy has plenty of occupation.' The young shepherds assured her that they would do exactly as she prescribed, and all four, leading their flocks into the meadows, left Madame Tutu alone with the good woman. She remarked some anxiety in her manner. "'What is the matter, madam?' said the fairy. "'What cloud has come over your mind?' "'Oh, I will not deny,' said the good woman, "'that I am uneasy at leaving them all thus together. I have for some time perceived with sorrow that Finfin and Lirette love each other more than is desirable, and here, to add to my trouble, another attachment springs up. The prince and Murtis do not dislike each other, and I fear to leave their youth exposed to the wandering of their hearts. "'You have brought up these two young girls so well,' replied Madame Tutu, "'that you need fear nothing. I will answer for their discretion. I will enlighten you as to their destiny.' 
She then informed her that Finfin was the son of the wicked king and brother of the young prince, that Mirtis and Lirette were sisters, and daughters of the deceased king, who had been murdered, and who was the brother of the queen, whom the cruel usurper had married, so that these four young persons were near relations, that the wicked king had ascended the throne after having committed a hundred atrocities, which he wished to crown by the murder of the two princes, that the queen did all she could to prevent him, and not being able to succeed, she had called her, the fairy, to her assistance, that she then told the queen she would save them, but that she could only do so by taking with them her eldest son, that she undertook to promise she should see them again some day in happiness, that on those conditions the queen had consented to a separation which appeared at first very hard, that she had carried them all three off, and that she had confided them to the care of the good woman as the person most worthy of such an office. After this, the fairy begged her to be at ease, assuring her that the union of these young princes would restore peace to the kingdom, wherein Finfin would reign with Lirette. The good woman listened to this discourse with great interest, but not without letting fall some tears. Madame Tutu was surprised at this emotion, and asked the cause. "'Oh, alas!' said she. I fear they will lose their innocence by this grandeur to which they will be elevated, and that so brilliant a fortune will corrupt their virtue. No, replied the fairy, do not fear so great a misfortune. The principles you have instilled into them are too excellent. It is possible to be a king, and yet an honest man. You know that there is one in the universe who is the model of perfect monarchs. Therefore set your mind at rest. I shall be with you as much as possible, and I hope you will not be melancholy here. The good woman believed her, and after a short time felt perfectly satisfied. The young shepherds were so happy also that they desired nothing but the continuance of their agreeable mode of life. Their pleasures, although tranquil, were not without interest. They saw each other every day, and the days only appeared to them too short. The bad king learned that they were with Madame Tutu, but all his power could not take them away from her. He knew by what magic spell she protected them. He saw clearly that he could only get the better of them by stratagem. He had not been able to inhabit the House of Roses in consequence of the continual tricks played on him by Madame Tutu. He hated her more than ever, as well as the good woman, and his hatred now extended also to his son. He employed all kinds of artifice in order to get into his power some one of the four young shepherds, but his art did not extend to the dominions of Madame Tutu. One unlucky day, there are some which we cannot avoid, these amiable shepherds had bent their steps in the direction of the fatal oak, when the beautiful Lirette preserved upon a tree, about twenty paces distant, a bird of such rare plumage that she let fly an arrow at it on the impulse of the moment and seeing the bird fall dead, ran to pick it up. All this was done instantaneously and without reflection, but the poor Lirette found, to her cost, that she was caught herself. It was impossible for her to return. She desired, but had no power to do so. She discovered her error, and all she could do was to extend her arms for pity to her brothers and sisters. Murtis began to cry, and Finfin, without hesitation, ran to her. I will perish with you, he cried, and in a moment had joined her. Murtis wished to follow them, but the young prince detained her. Let us go and apprise Madame Tutu of this, said he. That is the best assistance we can render them. At the same moment they saw the people of the wicked king seize them, and all they could do was to cry adieu to each other. The king had caused this beautiful bird to be placed there by his hunters, to serve as a snare for the shepherds. He fully expected what had come to pass. They led Lirette and Finfin before the cruel monarch, who abused them terribly and had them confined in a dark and strong prison. It was then they began to lament that their little cherry and almond had lost their virtue. The fawn and the partridge sought for them, but the fawn, not being able to see them, shed some tears of grief, and finding the king had given orders that she should be taken and burnt alive, she saved herself by running fast to Murtis. The partridge was more fortunate, for she saw them every day through the grating of their prison. Happily for them, the king had not thought of separating them. When one loves, it is a pleasure to suffer together. The partridge flew back every day and came to tell the news to Madame Tutu, 
the good woman, and Mirtis. Mirtis was very unhappy, and without the handsome prince she would have been inconsolable. She resolved to write to these poor captives by the faithful partridge, and hung a little bottle of ink to her neck, with some paper, and put a pen in her beak. The good partridge, thus loaded, presented herself at the bars of the prison, and it was a great delight to our young shepherds to see her again. Finfin put out his hand, and took from her all she brought him, after which they began to read as follows. Murtis and the Prince, to Lirette and Finfin Know you how we languish during this cruel separation, that we sigh incessantly, and that perhaps it may kill us. We should already have died had we not been sustained by hope. That hope has supported us ever since Madame Tutu has assured us that you still lived. Believe us, dear Lorette and Finfin, we shall meet again, despite of malice, and be happy. This letter had a powerful effect on the minds of Lorette and Finfin. They were filled with joy, and wrote immediately this reply. Lorette and Finfin, to Murdis and the Prince. We have you received your letter with extreme pleasure. It has rejoiced us more than we could have anticipated. In these regions of horror our torments would be insupportable, but for the sweet consolation we derive from each other's presence. Near the object of our affections we are insensible to pain, and love renders everything delightful. Adieu, dear prince, adieu, Murdis. Encourage your mutual passion. Be always inspired by a tender fidelity. You hold out a hope to us in which we participate. The greatest blessing which can occur to us will be accompanied by your presence. Finfin, having attached this note to the neck of the partridge, she flew away with it very quickly. The young shepherds received such great consolation from it, but the good woman could not be comforted from the moment she had been separated from those so dear to her, and whom she knew to be in so much peril. "'How quickly my happiness has vanished!' said she to Madame Tutu. I seem to have been born only to be continually agitated. I thought I had taken the only means for ensuring my repose. Ah, oh, how purblind are mortals! And do you not know, replied the fairy, that there is no state of existence in this world in which one can live always happily? I do, replied the good woman, mournfully, and if one cannot find happiness in oneself, it is seldom found elsewhere. "'Madam, consider the fate of my children, I beg you. "'They have not remembered the orders I gave them,' replied Madame Tutu. "'But let us think of a remedy.' Madame Tutu entered her library with the good woman. She read nearly all the night, and having at length taken down and opened a large book, which she had frequently passed over, although its sides were covered with plates of gold, she appeared plunged on a sudden into a state of excessive sadness. After some time— and just as day was breaking, the good woman, observing a few tears fall on the leaves of the book, took the liberty to ask the cause of the fairy's sorrow. "'I grieve,' said she, "'at the irrevocable decree of fate, which I have learned from these pages, and which I shudder and tremble to acquaint you with.' "'Are they dead?' cried the good woman. "'No,' pursued Madame Tutu. "'But nothing can save them, unless you or I go and present ourselves to the king, and satisfy his vengeance.' I confess the truth to you, madam, continued the fairy, that I do not feel sufficient affection for them, nor enough courage to go thus and expose myself to his fury, and I question also if any one could be found capable of such a sacrifice. Pardon me, madam, replied the good woman with great firmness. I will go seek this king. No sacrifice is too great for me that will save my children. I will pour out for them with all my heart every drop of blood which I have in my veins. Madame Tutu could not sufficiently admire so grand a resolution. She promised to assist her in every way in her power, but that she found herself limited in this instance, in consequence of the fault which they had committed. The good woman took leave of her, and would not acquaint Murdis or the prince with her design, for fear of affecting them, and weakening her own determination. She set out with the partridge flying by her side, and as they passed the iron oak, the partridge snatched with her beak a little moss from its trunk, and placed it in the hands of the good woman. "'When you are in the greatest peril which can befall you,' said she to her, "'throw this moss at the feet of the king.' The good woman treasured up these words, and hardly had she advanced some steps when she was seized by some of the wicked king's soldiers, 
whom he always kept in readiness on the outskirts of the domain of Madame Tutu. They led her before him. "'I have thee at last, wicked creature,' said he. "'I will put thee to death by the most cruel torture.' "'I came but for that purpose,' replied she, "'and thou mayest exercise thy cruelty as thou wilt on me. Only spare my children, who are so young and incapable of having offended thee. I offer thee my life for theirs.' All who heard these words were filled with pity at her magnanimity. The king alone was unmoved. The queen, who was present, shed a torrent of tears. The king was so indignant with her that he would have killed her if her attendants had not placed themselves between them. She fled, uttering piercing cries. The barbarous king caused the good woman to be shut up, ordering them to feed her well in order to render approaching death more frightful to her. He commanded them to fill a pit with snakes, vipers, and serpents, promising himself the pleasure of precipitating the good woman into it. What a horrible mode of execution! It makes one shudder to think of it. The officers of this unjust prince obeyed him with regret, and when they had fulfilled this frightful order, the king came to the spot. They were about to bind the good woman when she begged them not to do so, assuring them that she had sufficient courage to meet death with her hands free. And feeling she had no time to lose, she approached the king and threw the moss at his feet. He was at that moment close to the frightful gulf, and stepping forward to inspect it again with pleasure, his feet slipped on the moss, and he fell in. Hardly had he reached the bottom of the pit, when the sanguinary reptiles darted upon him and stung him to death, and the good woman at the same instant found herself in company with her dear partridge in the house of roses. Whilst these things were happening, Finfin and Lorette were almost dead with misery in their fearful prison. Their innocent affection alone kept them alive. They were saying very sad and very affecting things to each other, when they perceived on a sudden the doors of their dungeon open, and admit Murtis, the handsome prince, and Madame Tutu, who threw themselves on her necks, and who, though speaking all at once, failed not, in the midst of this joyful confusion, to announce the death of the king. "'He was your father, Finfin, as well as that of the prince,' said Madame Tutu. "'But he was unnatural and tyrannical, and would a hundred times have put the queen, your dear mother, to death. "'Let us go to seek her,' they, they did so. "'Her amiable nature made her feel some regret at the death of the king, her husband. "'Finfin and the prince also paid all decent respect to his memory.' Finfin was acknowledged king, and Murtis and Lirette princesses. They went all together to the House of Roses to see the generous good woman, who thought she should die of joy in embracing them. They all acknowledged that they owed their lives to her, and more than their lives, as they were indebted to her for their happiness also. From that moment they considered themselves perfectly happy. The marriages were celebrated with great pomp. King Finfin espoused the Princess Lirette and Murtis the Prince. When these splendid nuptials were over, the good woman asked permission to retire to the House of Roses. They were very unwilling to consent to this, but yielded to her sincere wish. The widowed queen also desired to pass the rest of her life with the good woman, and the partridge and the fawn did likewise. They were quite disgusted with the world, and found tranquillity in that charming retreat. Madame Tutu often went to visit them, as did the king and queen, the prince and the princess. Happy those who can imitate the actions of the good woman. Such grandeur of soul must ever meet due reward. Little do they fear, being wrecked on the shoals of fortune, who can give up all with so much courage. Discretion, sense, virtue. What may not mortals owe to you, their truest friends in need? End of section 18 Recording by Veronica Cerny Section 19 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Beauty and the Beast by Madame de Villeneuve. Translated by James Blanche. Part 1. In a country very far from this is to be seen a great city, wherein trade flourishes abundantly. 
It numbered amongst its citizens a merchant who succeeded in all his speculations, and upon whom fortune, responding to his wishes, had always showered her fairest favours. But if he had immense wealth, he had also a great many children, his family consisting of six boys and six girls. None of them were settled in life. The boys were too young to think of it, the girls too proud of their fortunes, upon which they had every reason to count, could not easily determine upon the choice they should make. Their vanity was flattered by the attentions of the handsomest young gentlemen, but a reverse of fortune, which they did not at all expect, came to trouble their felicity. Their house took fire, the splendid furniture with which it was filled, the account books, the notes, gold, silver, and all the valuable stores, which formed the merchant's principal wealth, were enveloped in this fatal conflagration, which was so violent that very few of the things could be saved. This first misfortune was but the forerunner of others. The father, with whom hitherto everything had prospered, lost at the same time, either by shipwreck or by pirates, all the ships he had at sea. His correspondence made him a bankrupt. His foreign agents were treacherous. In short, from the greatest opulence, he suddenly fell into the most abject poverty. He had nothing left but a small country house, situated in a lonely place, more than a hundred leagues from the city in which he usually resided. Impelled to seek a place of refuge from noise and tumult, he took his family to this retired spot. Who were in despair at such a revolution? The daughters of this unfortunate merchant were especially horrified at the prospect of the life they should have to lead in this dull solitude. For some time they flattered themselves that, when their father's intention became known, their lovers, who had hitherto sued in vain, would be only too happy to find they were inclined to listen to them. They imagined that the many admirers of each would be all striving to obtain the preference. They thought if they wished only for a husband, they would obtain one. But they did not remain very long in such a delightful illusion. They had lost their greatest attractions when, like a flash of lightning, their father's splendid fortune had disappeared, and their time for choosing had departed with it. Their crowd of admirers vanished at the moment of their downfall. Their beauty was not sufficiently powerful to retain one of them. Their friends were not more generous than their lovers. From the hour they became poor, every one, without exception, ceased to know them. Some were even cruel enough to impute their misfortunes to their own acts. Those whom the father had most obliged were his most vehement calumniators. They reported that all his calamities were brought on by his own bad conduct his prodigality and the foolish extravagance of himself and his children. This wretched family, therefore, could not do better than depart from a city wherein everybody took a pleasure in insulting them in their misfortunes. Having no resource whatever, they shut themselves up in their country house, situated in the middle of an almost impenetrable forest, and which might well be considered the saddest abode in the world. What misery they had to endure in this frightful solitude! They were forced to do the hardest work, not being able to have any one to wait upon them. This unfortunate merchant's sons were compelled to divide the servants' duties amongst them, as well as to exert themselves in every way that people must do who have to earn their livelihood in the country. The daughters, on their part, had sufficient employment like the poor peasant girls, they found themselves obliged to employ their delicate hands in all the labours of a rural life, wearing nothing but woollen dresses, having nothing to gratify their vanity, existing upon what the land could give them, limited to common necessaries, but still retaining a refined and dainty taste. 
These girls incessantly regretted the city and its attractions. Their recollection even of their younger days passed so rapidly in a round of mirth and pleasure was their greatest tournament. The youngest girl, however, displayed greater perseverance and firmness in their common misfortune. She bore her lot cheerfully, and with a strength of mind much beyond her years, not but what at first she was truly melancholy. Alas, who would not have felt such misfortunes? But after deploring her father's ruin, could she do better than resume her former gaiety? make up her mind to the position she was placed in and forget a world which she and her family had found so ungrateful and the friendship of which she was so fully persuaded was not to be relied upon in the time of adversity anxious to console herself and her brothers by her amiable disposition and sprightliness there was nothing she did not do to amuse them the merchant had spared no cost in her education nor in that of her sisters at this sad period she derived all the advantage from it she desired as she could play exceedingly well upon various instruments and sing to them charmingly she asked her sisters to follow her example but her cheerfulness and patience only made them more miserable these girls who were so inconsolable in their ill fortune thought their youngest sister showed a poor and mean spirit and even silliness to be so merry in the state it had pleased providence to reduce them to how happy she is said the eldest she was intended for such coarse occupations with such low notions what would she have done in the world such remarks were unjust this young person was much more fitted to shine in society than either of them she was a perfectly beautiful young creature her good temper rendered her adorable a generous and tender heart was visible in all her words and actions quite as much alive to the reverses that had just overwhelmed her family as either of her sisters by strength of mind which is not common in her sex she concealed it her sorrow and rose superior to her misfortunes so much firmness was considered to be insensibility but one can easily appeal from a judgment pronounced by jealousy every intelligent person who saw her in her true light was eager to give her the preference over her sisters in the midst of her greatest splendor although distinguished by her merit she was so handsome that she was called the beauty known by this name only what more was required to increase the jealousy and hatred of her sisters her charms and the general esteem in which she was held might have induced her to hope for a much more advantageous establishment than her sisters but feeling only for her father's misfortunes far from retarding his departure from a city in which she had enjoyed so much pleasure she did all she could to expedite it this young girl was as contented in their solitude as she had been in the midst of the world to amuse herself in her hours of relaxation she would dress her hair with flowers and like the shepherdesses of former times forgetting in a rural life all that had most gratified her in the height of opulence every day brought to her some new innocent pleasure two years had already passed and the family began to be accustomed to a country life when a hope of returning prosperity arrived to discompose their tranquillity the father received news that one of his vessels that he thought was lost had safely arrived in port richly laden his informants added they feared the factors would take advantage of his absence and sell the cargo at a low price and by this fraud make a great profit at his expense he imparted these tidings to his children who did not doubt for an instant but that they should soon be enabled to return from exile the girls much more impatient than the boys thinking it was unnecessary to wait for more certain proof were anxious to set out instantly and to leave everything behind them but the father who was more prudent begged them to moderate their delight 
however important he was to his family at a time when the labors of the field could not be interrupted without great loss he determined to leave his sons to get in the harvest and that he would set out upon this long journey his daughters with the exception of the youngest expected they would soon be restored to their former opulence they fancied that even if their father's property would not be considerable enough to settle them in their great metropolis their native place he would at least have sufficient for them to live in a less expensive city they trusted they should find good society there attract admirers and profit by the first offer that might be made to them scarcely remembering the troubles they had undergone for the last two years believing themselves to be already as by a miracle removed from poverty into the lap of plenty they ventured for retirement had not cured them of the taste for luxury and display to overwhelm their father with foolish commissions they requested him to make purchases of jewelry attire and headdresses each endeavoured to outvie the other in her demands so that the sum total of their father's supposed fortune would not have been sufficient to satisfy them beauty who was not the slave of ambition and who always acted with prudence so directly that if he executed her sister's commissions it would be useless for her to ask for anything but the father astonished at her silence said interrupting his insatiable daughters well beauty dost thou not desire anything what shall i bring thee what dost thou wish for speak freely my dear papa replied the amiable girl embracing him affectionately i wish for one thing more precious than all the ornaments my sister have asked you for i have limited my desires to it and shall be only too happy if they can be fulfilled it is the gratification of seeing you return in perfect health this answer was so unmistakably disinterested that it covered the others with shame and confusion they were so angry that one of them answering for the rest said with bitterness this child gives herself great airs and fancies that she will distinguish herself by these affected heroics surely nothing can be more ridiculous but the father touched by her expressions could not help showing his delight at them appreciating too the feeling which induced her to ask nothing for herself he begged she would choose something and to allay the ill will that his other daughters had towards her he observed to her that such indifference to dress was not natural at her age that there was a time for everything very well my dear father said she since you desire me to make some request i beg you will bring me a rose i love that flower passionately and since i have lived in this desert i have not had the pleasure of seeing one this was to obey her father and at the same time to avoid putting him to any expense for her at length the day arrived that this good old man was compelled to leave his family he travelled as fast as he could to the great city to which the prospect of a new fortune recalled him but he did not meet with the benefits he had hoped for his vessel had certainly arrived but his partners believing him to be dead had taken possession of it and all the cargo had been disposed of thus instead of entering into the full and peaceable possession of that which belonged to him he was compelled to encounter all sorts of chicanery in the pursuit of his rights he overcame them but after more than six months of trouble and expense he was not any richer than he was before his debtors had become insolvent and he could hardly defray his own costs thus terminated this dream of riches to add to his disagreeables he was obliged on the score of economy to start on his homeward journey at the most inconvenient time and in the most frightful weather exposed on the road to the piercing blast he thought he should die with fatigue but when he found himself within a few miles of his house which he did not reckon upon leaving for such false hopes 
and which beauty had shown her sense in mistrusting. His strength returned to him. It would be some hours before he could cross the forest. It was late, but he wished to continue his journey. He was benighted, suffering from intense cold, buried, one might say, in the snow with his horse, not knowing which way to bend his steps. He thought his last hour had come, no hut in his road, although the forest was filled with them. A tree, hollowed by age, was the best shelter he could find and only too happy was he to hide himself in it. This tree, protecting him from the cold, was the means of saving his life, and the horse a little distance from his master, perceiving another hollow tree, was led by instinct to take shelter in that. The night in such a situation appeared to him to be never-ending. Furthermore, he was vanished, frightened at the roaring of the wild beasts, that were constantly passing by him. Could he be at peace for an instant? His trouble and anxiety did not end with the night. He had no sooner the pleasure of seeing daylight than his distress was greater. The ground appeared so extraordinarily covered with snow. No road could he find. No track was to be seen. It was only after great fatigue and frequent falls that he succeeded in discovering something like a path upon which he could keep his footing proceeding without knowing in which direction chance led him into the avenue of a beautiful castle which the snow seemed to have respected it consisted of four rows of orange trees laden with flowers and fruit statues were seen here and there regardless of order or symmetry, somewhere in the middle of the road, others among the trees, all after the strangest fashion. They were of the size of life, and had the color of human beings in different attitudes and in various dresses, the greatest number representing warriors. Arriving at the first courtyard, he perceived a great many more statues. He was suffering so much from cold that he could not stop to examine them. An agate staircase with balusters of chased gold first presented itself to his sight. He passed through several magnificently furnished rooms. A gentle warmth which he breathed in them renovated him. He needed food, but to whom could he apply? This large and magnificent edifice appeared to be inhabited only by statues. A profound silence reigned throughout it, Nevertheless, it had not the air of an old palace that had been deserted. The halls, the rooms, the galleries were all open. No living thing appeared to be in this charming place. Weary of wandering over this vast dwelling, he stopped in a saloon, wherein was a large fire, presuming that it was prepared for someone who would not be long in appearing. He drew near the fireplace to warm himself but no one came seated on a sofa near the fire a sweet sleep closed his eyelids and left him no longer in a condition to observe the entrance of any one fatigue induced him to sleep hunger awoke him he had been suffering from it for the last twenty-four hours the exercise that he had taken ever since he had been in this palace increased his appetite when he awoke and opened his eyes, he was astonished to see a table elegantly laid. A light repast would not have satisfied him, but the viands, magnificently dressed, invited him to eat of everything. His first care was to utter in a loud voice his thanks to those from whom he had received so much kindness, and he then resolved to wait quietly till it pleased his host to make himself known to him. As fatigue caused him to sleep before his repast, so did the food produce the same effect, and his repose was longer and more powerful. In fact, this second time he slept for at least four hours. Upon awaking in the place of the first table, he saw another porphyry, upon which some kind hand had set out a collation consisting of cakes, 
preserved fruits and liqueurs. This was likewise for his use. Profiting, therefore, by the kindness shown him, he partook of everything that suited his appetite, his taste, and his fancy. Finding at length no one to speak to or to inform him whether this palace was inhabited by a man or by a god, fear began to take possession of him, for he was naturally timid. He resolved, therefore, to repass through all the apartments and overwhelm them with thanks to the genius to whom he was in debt for so much kindness, and in the most respectful manner solicit him to appear. All his attentions were useless. No appearance of servants, no result by which he could ascertain that the palace was inhabited. Thinking seriously of what he should do, he began to fancy for what reason he could not imagine that some good spirit had made this mansion a present to him with all the riches that it contained this idea seemed like an inspiration and without further delay making a new inspection of it he took possession of all the treasures he could find more than this he settled in his own mind what share of it he should allow to each of his children and selected the apartments which would particularly suit them enjoying the delight beforehand which his journey would afford them he entered the garden where in spite of the severity of the winter the rarest flowers were exhaling the most delicious perfume in the mildest and purest air birds of all kinds blending their songs with the confused noise of the waters made an agreeable harmony the old man in ecstasies at such wonders said to himself my daughters will not i think find it very difficult to accustom themselves to this delicious abode i cannot believe that they will regret or that they will prefer the city to this mansion let me set out directly cried he in a transport of joy rather uncommon for him i shall increase my happiness in witnessing theirs i will take possession at once upon entering this charming castle he had taken care notwithstanding he was nearly perished to unbridle his horse and let him wind his way to a stable which he had observed in the forecourt an alley ornamented by palisades formed by rose bushes in full bloom led to it he had never seen such lovely roses their perfume reminded him that he had made promise to give beauty a rose he picked one and was about to gather enough to make a half a dozen bouquets when a most frightful noise made him turn round he was terribly alarmed upon perceiving at his side a horrible beast which with an air of fury laid upon his neck a kind of truck resembling an elephant's and said with a terrific voice who gave thee permission to gather my roses it is not enough that i kindly allow thee to remain in my palace and instead of feeling grateful rash man i find thee stealing my flowers thy insolence shall not remain unpunished the good man already too much overpowered by the unexpected appearance of this monster thought he should die of fright at these words and quickly throwing away the fatal rose oh my lord said he protesting himself before him have mercy on me i am not ungrateful penetrated by all your kindness i did not imagine that so slight a liberty could possibly have offended you the monster very angrily replied hold thy tongue thou foolish joker i care not for thy flattery nor for the titles thou bestowest on me i am not my lord i am the beast and thou shalt not escape the death thou deservest the merchant dismayed at so cruel a sentence and thinking that submission was the only means to preserve his life said in a truly affecting manner that the rose he had dared to take was for one of his daughters called beauty then whether he hoped to escape from death or to induce his enemy to feel for him he related to him all his misfortunes 
He told him the object of his journey, and did not omit to dwell on the little present he was bound to give Beauty, adding that was the only thing she had asked for, while the riches of a king would hardly have sufficed to satisfy the wishes of his other daughters, and so came to the opportunity which had offered itself to satisfy the modest desire of Beauty, and his belief that he could have done so without any unpleasant consequences, asking pardon moreover for his involuntary fault the beast considered for a moment then speaking in a milder tone he said to him i will pardon thee but upon condition that thou wilt give me one of thy daughters i require some one to repair this fault just heaven replied the merchant how can i keep my word could i be so inhuman as to save my own life at the expense of one of my children's under what pretext could i bring her here there must be no pretext interrupted the beast i expect that whichever daughter you bring here she will come willingly or i will not have either of them go see if there be not one amongst them sufficiently courageous and loving thee enough to sacrifice herself to save thy life thou appears to be an honest man give me thy word of honour to return in a month if thou canst decide to bring one of them back with thee she will remain here and thou wilt return home if thou canst not do so promise me to return hither alone after bidding them farewell forever for thou wilt belong to me do not fancy continued the monster winting his teeth that by merely agreeing to my proposition thou wilt be saved i warn thee if thou thinkest so to escape me i will speak for thee destroy thee and thy race although a hundred thousand men appear to defend thee the good man although quite convinced that he should not vainly put to the proof the devotion of his daughters accepted nevertheless the monster's proposition he promised to return to him at the time named and give himself up to his sad fate without rendering it necessary for the beast to seek for him after this assurance he thought himself at liberty to retire and take leave of the beast whose presence was most distressing to him the respite was but brief yet he feared he might revoke it he expressed his anxiety to depart but the beast told him he should not do so till the following day thou wilt find said he a horse ready at break of day he will carry thee home quickly adieu go to supper and await my orders the poor man more dead than alive returned to the saloon in which he had feasted so heartily before a large fire his supper already laid invited him to sit and enjoy it the delicacy and richness of the dishes had no longer however any temptation for him overwhelmed by his grief he would not have seated himself at the table but he feared that the beast was concealed it somewhere and observing him and that he would excite his anger by any slight of his bounty to avoid further disaster he made a momentary truce with his grief, and as well as his afflicted heart would permit, he tasted in turn the various dishes. At the end of the repast a great noise was heard in the adjoining apartment, and he did not doubt that it was his formidable host, as he could not manage to avoid his presence. He tried to recover from the alarm which this sudden noise had caused him. At the same moment, the beast who appeared asked him abruptly if he had made a good supper. The good man replied in a modest and timid tone that he had, thanks to his attention, eaten heartily. Promise me, replied the monster, to remember your word to me and to keep it as a man of honor in bringing me one of your daughters. The old man, who was not much entertained with this conversation, swore to him that he would fulfil what he had promised 
and return in a month alone or with one of his daughters, if he should find one who loved him sufficiently to follow him on the conditions he must propose to her. I warn thee again, said the beast, to take care not to deceive her as to the sacrifice which thou must exact from her or the danger she will incur. Paint to her my face such as it is. Let her know what she is about to do. Above all, let her be firm in her resolution. There will be no time for reflection when thou shalt have brought her hither. There must be no drawing back. Thou wilt be equally lost without obtaining for her the liberty to return. The merchant, who was overcome at this discourse, reiterated his promise to confirm to all that was prescribed to him. The monster, satisfied with his answer, ordered him to retire to rest, and not to rise till he should see the sun and hear a golden bell. Thou wilt breakfast before setting out, said he again, and thou mayst take a rose with thee for beauty. The horse which shall bear thee will be ready in the courtyard. I reckon on seeing thee again in a month, if thou art an honest man. If thou failest in thy word, I shall pay thee a visit. The good man, for fear of prolonging a conversation already too painful to him, made a profound reverence to the beast, who told him again not to be anxious respecting the road by which he should return as at the time appointed the same horse which he would mount the next morning would be found at his gate and would suffice for his daughter and himself however little disposition the old man felt for sleep he dared not disobey the orders he had received obliged to lie down he did not rise till the sun began to illumine the chamber his breakfast was soon dispatched and he then descended into the garden to gather the rose which the beast had ordered him to take to beauty how many tears this flower caused him to shed but the fear of drawing on himself new disasters made him constrain his feelings and he went without further delay in search of the horse which he had been promised him he found on the saddle a light but warm cloak. As soon as the horse felt him on his back, he set off with incredible speed. The merchant, who in a moment lost sight of this fatal palace, experienced as great a sensation of joy as he had on the previous evening, felt in perceiving it, with this difference that the delight of leaving it was embittered by the cruel necessity of returning to it. To what have I pledged myself? said he, whilst his courser carried him with a velocity and lightness which is only known in fairy land. Would it not be better that I should become at once the victim of this monster who thirsts for the blood of my family? By a promise I have made, as unnatural as it is indiscreet, I have prolonged my life. Is it possible that I could think of extending my days at the expense of those of my daughters? Can I have the barbarity to lead one to him, to see him, no doubt, devour her before my eyes? But all at once, interrupting himself, he cried, Miserable wretch that I am! What have I to fear, if I could find it in my heart, to silence the voice of nature? Would it depend on me to commit this cowardly act? She must know her fate and consent to it. I see no chance that she will be inclined to sacrifice herself for an inhuman father, and I ought not to make such a proposition to her. It is unjust, but even the affection which they all entertain for me should induce one to devote herself would not a single glance at the beast destroy her constancy? And I could not complain. Ah, too imperious beast, exclaimed he. Thou hast done this expressly by putting an impossible condition to the means thou offerest me to escape thy fury and obtain the pardon of a trifling fault. Thou hast added insult to injury. 
But, continued he, I cannot bear to think of it. I hesitate no longer, and I would rather expose myself without turning away from thy rage, than attempt a useless mode of escape which my parental love trembles to employ. Let me retrace, said he, the road to this frightful palace, and without deigning to purchase so dearly the remnant of a life which can never be but miserable, without waiting for the month which accorded me to expire, return and terminate this day my miserable existence. At these words he endeavoured to retrace his steps, but he found it impossible to return the bridle of his horse, allowing himself therefore against his will to be carried forward he resolved at least to propose nothing to his daughters. Already he saw his house in the distance, and strengthening himself more and more in his resolution. I will not speak to them, he said, of the danger which threatens me. I shall have the pleasure of embracing them once more. I shall give them my last advice. I will beg them to live on good terms with their brothers, whom I shall also implore not to abandon them. In the midst of this reverie, he reached his door. His own horse, which had found its way home the previous evening, had alarmed his family. His sons, dispersed in the forest, had sought him in every direction, and his daughters, in their impatience to hear some tidings of him, were at the door in order to obtain the earliest intelligence. As he was mounted on a magnificent steed and wrapped in a rich cloak, they could not recognize him, but took him at first for a messenger sent by him, and the rose which they perceived attached to the pommel of the saddle made them perfectly easy on his account. When this afflicted father, however, approached nearer, they recognized him, and thought only of evincing their satisfaction at seeing him return in good health, but the sadness depicted in his face and his eyes filled with tears, which he vainly endeavoured to restrain, changed their joy into anxiety. All hastened to inquire the cause of his trouble. He made no reply, but by saying to Beauty, as he presented her with the rose, There is what thou hast demanded of me, but thou wilt pay dearly for it, as well as the others. I was certain, exclaimed the eldest, and I was saying this very moment that she would be the only one whose commission you would execute at this time of the year. A rose must have cost more than you would have had to pay for us all five together. And judging from appearances, the rose will be faded before the day is ended. Never mind, however, you were determined to gratify the fortunate beauty at any price. It is true, replied the father mournfully that this rose has cost me dear and more dear than all the ornaments which you wish for would have done it is not in money however and would to heaven that i might have purchased it with all i am yet worth in the world these words excited the curiosity of his children and dispelled the resolution which he had taken not to reveal his adventure he informed them of the ill success of his journey, the trouble which he had undergone in running after a chimerical fortune, and all that had taken place in the palace of the monster. After this explanation, despair took the place of hope and of joy. The daughters, seeing all their projects annihilated by this thunderbolt, uttered fearful cries. The brothers, more courageous, said resolutely, that they would not suffer their father to return to this frightful castle, that they were bold enough to deliver the earth from this horrible beast, even supposing he should have the temerity to come in search of him. The good man, although moved at their affliction, forbade them to commit violence, telling them that as he had given his word, he would kill himself rather than fail to keep it. Notwithstanding this, they thought for expedience to save his life. The young men, full of courage and filial affection, proposed that one of them should go and offer himself as a victim to the wrath of the beast. 
but the monster had said positively and explicitly that he would have one of the daughters and not one of the sons. The brave brothers grieved that their good intention could not be acted upon, then did what they could to inspire their sisters with the same sentiments. But their jealousy of beauty was sufficient to raise an invincible obstacle to such heroic action. It is not just, said they, that we should perish in so frightful a manner for a fault of which we are not guilty. It would be to render us victims to beauty, to whom they would be very glad to sacrifice us. But duty does not require such a sacrifice. Here is the fruit of the moderation and perpetual preaching of this unhappy girl. Why did she not ask, like us, for a good stock of clothes and jewels? If we had not had them, it has at all events caused nothing for asking, and we have no cause to reproach ourselves for having exposed the life of our father by indiscreet demands. If, by an affected disinterestedness, she had not thought to distinguish herself, as she is in all things more favoured than we, he would have no doubt found enough money to content her, but she must needs by her singular caprice bring on us all this misfortune. It is she who has caused it, and they wish us to pay the penalty? We will not be her dupe. She has brought it on herself, and she must find the remedy. Beauty, whose grief had almost deprived her of her consciousness, suppressing her sobs and sighs, said to her sisters, I am the cause of this misfortune. It is I alone who must repair it. I confess it would be unjust to allow you to suffer for my fault. Alas, it was, notwithstanding an innocent wish, could I foresee the desire to have a rose when we were in the middle of summer would be punished so cruelly? The fault is committed, however, whether I am innocent or guilty. It is just that I should expiate it. It cannot be imputed to any one else. I will risk my life, pursued she in a firm tone. To release my father from his fatal engagement, I will go to find the beast, too happy in being able to die in order to preserve the life of him from whom I received mine, and to silence your murmurs, do not fear that anything can turn me from my purpose. But I pray you during this month to do me the favor to spare me your reproaches. So much firmness in a girl of her age surprised them all much, and the brothers, who loved her tenderly, were moved at her resolution. They paid her infinite attention and felt the loss they were about to sustain. But it was requisite to save the life of a father. This spice motive closed their mouths, and well persuaded that it was a thing decided on, Far from thinking of combating so generous a purpose, they contented themselves by shedding tears and giving their sister all the praise which her noble resolution merited, all the more from her being only sixteen years of age and having the right to regret a life which she was about to sacrifice in so cruel a manner. The father alone would not consent to the design of his youngest daughter, but the others reproach him insolently with the charge that beauty alone was cared for by him, in spite of the misfortune which she had caused, and that he was sorry that it was not one of the elders who should pay for her imprudence. This unjust language forced him to desist. Besides, beauty assured him that if he would not accept the exchange, she would make it in spite of him for she would go alone to seek the beast, and so perish without saving him. How do we know, said she, forcing herself to assume more tranquillity than she really felt, perhaps the dreadful fate which appears to await me conceals another as happy as this seems terrible. Her sisters, hearing her speak thus, smiled maliciously at the wild idea. They were enchanted at the delusion in which they believed her to be indulging. 
But the old man, conquered by all her reasons, and remembering an ancient prediction, by which he had learned that this daughter should save his life, and that she should be a source of happiness to all her family, ceased to oppose the will of beauty. Incessantly they began to speak of their departure as a thing almost indifferent. It was she who gave the tone to the conversation, and in their presence she appeared to consider it as a happy event. It was only, however, to console her father and brothers, and not to alarm them more than necessary. Although discontented with the conduct of her sisters towards her, who appeared even impatient to see her depart, and thought the month passed too slowly, she had the generosity to divide all her little property and the jewels which she had at her own disposal amongst them. They received this with pleasure, this new proof of her generosity, but without abating their hatred of her. An extreme joy took possession of their hearts when they heard the horse neigh which was sent to carry away a sister whose amiability their jealous natures would not allow them to perceive. The father and the sons alone were so afflicted that they could not contain themselves at this fatal moment. They proposed to strangle the horse. Beauty, however, preserving all her tranquillity, showed them again on this occasion the absurdity of such a design, and the impossibility of executing it. After having taken leave of her brothers, she embraced her hard-hearted sisters, taking such a tender farewell of them that she drew from them some tears, and they believed, for the space of a few minutes, that they were almost as much afflicted as their brothers. End of section 19